Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to offer my own welcome to the FDLI Annual Conference. I'm Dan Krakow, a partner at Arnold Porter and chair of FDLI's Board of Directors. I'd prefer to be greeting all of you in person, but we're all doing what we must do to stay safe. And as Amy just mentioned, we look forward to gathering in person at next year's annual conference. I thank all of you, all of you for joining us virtually again this year for this great opportunity to come together as a community. We'll begin the conference hearing from FDA, and it's my honor to introduce our first speaker of the conference, Janet Woodcock, Acting Commissioner of FDA. Janet Woodcock began her long and distinguished FDA career in 1986 with the agency's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research as Director of the Division of Biological Investigational Drugs. She also served as CEPR's Acting Deputy Director and later as the, as the Director of the Office of Therapeutics Research and Review. In 1994, Dr. Woodcock was named Director of FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, overseeing the center's work that is the world's gold standard for drug approval and safety. In that position, she has led many of the FDA's groundbreaking drug initiatives. She's also served in other leadership roles at FDA, including as deputy commissioner and chief medical officer. With the onset of the COVID-19 public health emergency last year, Dr. Woodcock was asked to lend her expertise to Operation Warp Speed with respect to the initiative to develop therapeutics in response to the pandemic. Dr. Woodcock was named Acting Commissioner of Food and Drugs on January 20th, 2021. She has received numerous honors during her distinguished public health career, and we appreciate Dr. Woodcock taking the time to speak to us today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank her personally for her critical public service over many years, and particularly for her contributions to meeting the challenge of the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock, and we look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you, Daniel. And it's a pleasure to join everyone once again for Fidley's annual conference. Some things need to go on. I know we're all looking forward to meeting in person at some point. And the good news is we're getting closer. Last year at this time, our nation faced an uncertain future. Since then, we've made enormous progress in combating the virus. And I'm especially proud of the work that FDA has done. And yet, of course, thousands of people are still being infected daily and new variants are emerging and, and continue to pose a threat. Most tragically, many are still dying and there are outbreaks that are very serious around the world. It reminds us we must continue to be safe and vigilant and work to ensure everyone has access to a vaccine and gets vaccinated. Even as we continue to respond to the pandemic, I believe we're at a critical inflection point, a time to more closely examine our response to this crisis, gauge what has worked, and formulate and implement plans to uh, effectively transition to what comes next. Today, I'll highlight some of FDA's accomplishments in the past year, but I also want to discuss how FDA is using this experience to build for the future. And I'm sure you'll hear about this from many of the other FDA speakers. Now, the effort by the FDA's workforce over the past year and a half has been nothing short of monumental. Certainly at the top, that list is supporting the development, authorization, and distribution of three vaccines that have met our robust standards for safety and effectiveness, including one that now can be used in adolescents down to 12. Our Drugs and Biologic Centers also established the Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program, or CCAP, to move new, safe, and effective uh, treatments to patients as quickly as possible, uh, or to EUAs. The numbers are revealing. At the end of April, there were more than 610 COVID-19 drug development programs in the planning stages, and more than 450 trials had been reviewed by the agency. Nine COVID-19 treatments are currently authorized for emergency use and one COVID-19 treatment had been approved by the FDA. Our Center for Devices and Radiologic Health also had a very heavy uh, workload during this time. They've issued more than 400 emergency use authorizations covering nearly 800 medical products, including molecular diagnostic antigen and serology tests sample collection devices, personal protective equipment, and ventilators. 
to just cite the most prominent. And our Office of Regulatory Affairs helped facilitate access to necessary and effective PPE, diagnostics, therapies, and vaccines by implementing strategies and operational policies to streamline and clarify the import process for industry. The Office of Regulatory Affairs also helped lead the way on FDA's expansive effort to protect consumers from products that could be dangerous or sold with fraudulent claims to prevent or treat the virus. And of course, this type of activity always emerges during a crisis where people will take advantage of others' desperation and fear. To date, the FDA has identified more than 1,300 fraudulent and unproven medical products related to COVID-19. We've issued more than 170 warning letters to companies and individuals selling unproven products with nearly 70% of the recipients taking voluntary action in response. We also then worked with the Department of Justice to obtain injunctive relief against several companies that did not take appropriate voluntary action. And in some cases, our Office of Criminal Investigations has worked with DOJ to prosecute companies and individuals engaged in fraudulent COVID-related conduct. Our Operation Quack Hack team has also reviewed thousands of websites, social media posts, and online marketplace listings. Um, leading domain registrars and online marketplaces to review and take down nearly 300 websites and well over a thousand listings selling unproven COVID-19 related FDA regulated products. So well done to get, get rid of those. We also advise consumers not to use certain hand sanitizer products, including some hand sanitizers that contain dangerous ingredients such as methanol. And we've coordinated with manufacturers and distributors on the voluntary recall of more than 170 such products. Our Center for Veterinary Medicine warned consumers about certain veterinary products like chloroquine phosphate and ivermectin, which were being improperly redirected for human treatments, potentially causing significant adverse events and even death. It also worked with industry to set up forecasting and voluntary reporting for COVID impacted supply chains for veterinary medicines, livestock and pet food. The FDA foods program developed a data analysis tool called 21 forward to track the forecasted incidence of COVID-19 across the country and identify areas in which its spread could impact the food system, potentially disrupting the food supply chain continuity. It also provides information to federal and state partners to help support the vaccination of food and agriculture workers by helping de them determine how many food and agriculture workers they have in each county at various times, because many of these move uh, with the season. This brief summary just shows how the FDA team quickly pivoted, applying its experience, preparedness, and expertise to respond to this crisis. However, the regular, regular work did not go away. So just as important has been how the FDA workforce continued to fulfill the agency's regular critical responsibilities to protect the public health. Our Center for Tobacco Products has continued to apply a science-based approach to regulating an evolving tobacco landscape and protecting the public, especially kids, from the addiction, death, and disease caused by tobacco products. Most recently, with the full support of the administration, we committed to advancing two regulations that will dramatically change the landscape of combusted tobacco products. Specifically, one proposed product standard banning menthol in cigarettes and another banning all flavors, including menthol in cigars to publish as proposed rules within the next year, we hope, and plan. In April, the FDA foods team released the Closer to Zero Action Plan, identifying what the agency will do to reduce exposure to toxic elements from foods consumed by babies and young children. And last month, we took two important steps to advance the safety of leafy grains, which have posed a public health challenge. 
we released a report from our investigation into a fall 2020 E. coli outbreak and an updated version of the leafy green shigatoxin producing E. coli action plan. Our Center for Veterinary Medicine continued to support innovation in the animal drug industry. In December, it approved an intentional genetic, genomic alteration in a product called the Gal Safe Pig, which is the first alteration in an animal that the agency has approved for both human food consumption and potential therapeutic uses. Our human medical product centers acted on non-COVID products, approving hundreds of new drugs and biologics, and authorizing a record number of novel medical devices last year. Now, on the post-market side and outside in our society, opioid deaths have spiked during the pandemic very severely, and the opioid crisis remains front and center for the FDA. Currently, most fatalities are called, caused by illicit synthetic opioids, particularly fentanyl and its derivatives, and heroin, although deaths from prescription opioids remain high. Additionally, misuse of other psychoactive drugs, particularly stimulants, has also spiked over the past year. In response, the FDA has worked to accelerate development of safe and effective drug overdose reversal agents, as well as pharmacologic treatment for stimulant use disorder. This is on top of our efforts to facilitate safe prescribing practices and reduce exposure and preventable harm from uh, these products through safety labeling changes, professional guidance development, and other communications. Now, the FDA's One Health Initiative is another example of an area where the pandemic brought existing work to the forefront. One Health embraces the understanding that the health of people, animals, and their shared environment uh, are interconnected. The FDA's Office of the Chief Scientist and the Center for Veterinary Medicine have been leading our efforts in this area, which includes a focus on the possible animal origins of the pandemic and the potential for future ones to arise from zoonotic disease. One Health also overlaps with important work we're doing to counter antimicrobial resistance. We're collaborating with stakeholders and other partners in our continued efforts to support responsible stewardship of antimicrobials in both human and veterinary settings to preserve these critical uh, tools. So our work in each of these areas, as well as countless efforts, I haven't had time to mention, and I feel bad because everyone at the FDA has contributed so much. This work will have a profound impact on the health and safety of the American public for years to come. But they share another quality. They are informed by the best available science and the most rigorous data. Good science and data really are the DNA of the FDA. One of the FDA's greatest assets is our ability to respond quickly and effectively to public health emergencies while applying what we learn to future crises. The pandemic has tested us, but has also afforded us an opportunity to be smarter, more efficient, and better prepared for whatever else comes. To be an effective health and consumer agency for the 21st century, we need to expand our scientific and data capabilities. We need systems that do a better job talking to one another, enterprise platforms that we can use across the agency for multiple purposes. Many of the platforms we use today, which were groundbreaking when they're put in place, are sorely in need of update or re frank replacement. To help achieve this, we've launched the Technology Modernization Action Plan and the Data Modernization Action Plan. The TMAP is designed to help us modernize our approach to the use of technology in support of our regulatory mission. But technology, of course, is only half of the puzzle. As it has become more sophisticated and our world more connected, we need more and better data from new sources. And we have been working on this. During the pandemic, we've built on efforts to optimize design and conduct 
of clinical trials, diversify who's included, and add new data sources such as digital health data. This past year, our Oncology Center of Excellence began, began Project Equity and Project Silver, which focus on increasing minority and geriatric patient enrollment in clinical trials in cancer and bringing the voice of underrepresented populations to the world of drug development. And our Office of Minority Health and Health Equity and the Office of Women's Health continue to raise awareness and advance efforts to increase the participation of minorities and women in clinical trials. We also continue to expand our use of real world evidence and real world data in our regulatory decision making, which can help strengthen cl clinical trials and transform the efficiency of product reviews and also of post-market surveillance. For example, the FDA and uh, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at uh, NIH often called NCATS collaborated on the development of the Cure ID app. This gathers information from the clinical community on novel uses of existing drugs for difficult to treat infectious diseases, initially for tropical diseases, via a website, smartphone, or other mobile device. And our Office of Women's Health funded the expansion of the Cure Idea ID app to gather real world information on the use of medications for oncology and infectious diseases in pregnancy. How data is made available is also important. The automation of processes, use of mobile technologies and easier access to computing resources can support a better capability to track and trace medical and food products across the supply chain. The FDA's new era of smarter food safety initiative aspires to equip FDA with important new ways to apply available sources, including leveraging the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning to identify products that may pose a threat to the public health, for example, in, during importation. It will enable us to apply modern analytics to determine risks endpoint problems and speed our capacity to trace out back outbreaks, helping prevent foodborne illnesses, we hope, through faster and more effective identification of contaminated foods and where the, their origin. Better technology and data can also help us address recurring problems such as shortage of human and animal drugs, and these were really exacerbated during the pandemic, and supply chain disruptions, which was also a huge problem. We engaged with hundreds of drug manufacturers to understand supply chain problems, discover early warning signs of potential manufacturing discontinuations or interruptions, and help develop ways to mitigate risk of shortage. And we're also collaborating with our international regulatory partners on all this because they often have sources of intelligence that are useful to us and vice versa. In today's global environment with individual products sourced in many different countries, we often lack the necessary information data or visibility to know if production will be disrupted. Building new systems that provide better data and greater communication is one of the approaches we're taking. Another, of course, that I have um, champion for a long time is modernizing production systems using advanced manufacturing. We recently established several research and regulatory programs for advanced manufacturing building on existing work. The goal is to help lower production costs, increase access to critical medical products, and decrease the risk of supply disruption. And the the means here would be to improve the robustness of supply chain by redundancy of manufacture rather than having manufacture be concentrated in one large plant, which is then vulnerable to a wide variety of different kinds of disruptions. Finally, I want to mention uh, briefly how we're building on experience gained during the pandemic with respect to our inspections. One of the most significant decisions FDA made was to pause most foreign and domestic uh, inspections with the exception of mission critical inspectional work. 
the FDA resumed prioritized domestic inspections in July of 2020. We recently re released a resiliency roadmap for FDA inspectional oversight that discusses the impact of these actions and our plans for moving forward. It's an important report and our Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs, Judy McMeekin, will be discussing it further when she speaks to you. But this is our uh, beginning, uh, the facts on the ground for us moving forward in inspections. So in closing, I'd like to reiterate that we're only as good as the data we have to analyze and the science we have to apply to it. Or as Sherlock Holmes once said purportedly, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. And so when we're off in the unknown and we do not have data to guide our actions and decisions, naturally, we're not going to be as effective as when we have access to robust and solid data. Each day, though, brings new scientific advances, and the FDA needs to stay ahead of the curve on these. So you can look to us to be laser focused on building the modern technology and data platforms we need to most effectively meet our data challenges, daily challenges, sorry, and data challenges, and achieve our public health mission. Um, by this transformation, I think we will enable our scientists, our inspectors, and every person who works at FDA to be the most effective in meeting that public health mission. So I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodcock. We really appreciate your time today and also your incredibly hard work over the last year. And, and congratulations on being named acting commissioner. Um, and uh, we appreciate your remarks very much. And to the audience, I'd encourage the attendees to join us in the next session in about 10 minutes to hear from Mark Raza, the acting uh, chief counsel of the agency. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. You.